a pair of people are abseiling in the breathtakingly stunning mountains in Yosemite National Park. The man, a young handsome guy with long floppy hair and stubble, is spotting for the woman, who successfully climbs down and gives him a high five upon landing. He praises her, and she admits she was pretty scared. It seems that he's an instructor as he turns around to a group of assembled people, and asks with a smile who wants to go next. Cut to central Chicago, and a young woman, Zoe, is greeted by her coworker Harris who shows her some promotional material for her latest release. She's a professional photographer who recently received some poor reviews, but it seems like her most recent portfolio, which she published in a book, is selling well. She's not satisfied, though, saying that she's sure she can do better. He agrees, with a sparkle in his eye, and invites her to sit down as he has a great idea for her next venture. She should go to Yosemite, reveal it like nobody else has ever done, nature photos as art. He wants it for the fall collection, so she needs to have it all done in two months. Over 100 photos with accompanying small essays. Zoe isn't sure, but Harris is really excited, pitching her the full extent of his idea. This is just the start, she'll go all over the West, documenting Santa Fe, the Rockies, Big Sur. He's sure she's got the skills for it. Zoe still protests, though, saying that it's impossible to do any better than Ansel Adams, a nationally acclaimed photographer who has already captured everything Yosemite has to offer. Harris persists, though, saying it's her vision, fresh eyes, and she'll have an entirely new perspective. Don't try to follow Ansel Adams, but instead, she should come up with her own angle. Zoe finds herself unable to refuse. She drives out to the national park and is immediately excited by the beautiful scenery. She stops on the road and begins to take photos straight away, of the mountainside, forests and waterfalls. She's grinning as she puts the camera down, excited to get further in. Soon, she arrives at the park ranger's base, a cabin situated in the heart of the park, and she sees a man fishing in the river. It's the same man who was abseiling earlier on. She crouches down, unnoticed, and is about to take a candid photo of him when her phone begins to ring. She curses, but it's already too late. The man has noticed her and is frustrated because she's scaring off the fish. She answers the phone, it's Harris, checking that she's arrived safely. She confirms that she's excited to get started, but when she hangs up and turns to see if the man is still there, he's already left to find a more secluded spot. She's frustrated that her shot was ruined, and heads over the bridge and up towards the lodge. The woman at the desk, Sage, greets her politely, and Zoe asks if there are any park rangers that offer guided tours of the park. She wants someone who can take her to the famous vistas, but is specifically interested in the ecology of the park. Sage hands her the standard brochure and says that all the trails are marked. But the only involvement the rangers usually have is to give talks to the various tour groups. As Zoe walks away, however, Sage calls her back and corrects herself, saying there's one man who may be able to help her, because he knows more about the ecosystem in the park than anyone else. He used to be a rock climber, but he's recently branched out and is a general naturalist, living in the park and observing the wildlife. He's hard to get hold of, but his name is Jack Hawkins. Her grandfather runs a small outfitter's shop just outside the park, and he might know where to find him. Zoe heads out to the shop, deciding that finding local help is definitely the best way forward. Sage's grandfather Koss greets her kindly, assuming she's there for fishing tackle, but Zoe quickly corrects him and says she's there to look for Jack Hawkins. Unfortunately, though, the man says he hasn't seen Jack in a few weeks, but if he sees him, he'll let him know she's looking for him. Zoe asks more about Jack, and Koss tells her he's one of these all-around capable guys who does a bit of everything, but resides way off the grid. Deciding she can be trusted, he tells her how to find an unmarked trail off the highway that'll lead her to the area where Jack usually camps out. He places a small talisman in her hand and tells her it'll lead her there. Zoe is very grateful for his help. She takes the talisman, matching it against the landmarks on the road, and finds her way up to a cabin hidden away in the forest. When she approaches, Jack is there, pretending to be a conductor, waving a stick around with Ode to Joy playing loudly from a speaker. He clearly thinks he's alone. Zoe watches him, smiling, and when the song finishes, she applauds him. Startled, he drops the stick and whirls around, only to discover she's the same photographer who ruined his fishing earlier on. He's not happy she's there, and asks her to leave. She says that Koss told her where to find him, but he doesn't care, annoyed that she's followed him to his home. She shrugs, realizing that she won't be able to sway him, and trudges away, calling out over her shoulder that she was there at the performance of the Ninth Symphony in the Orchestra Hall in Chicago in 2017, the same recording that he was playing from his speaker. She was applauding him because it really was a magnificent performance. Intrigued by her knowledge of the concert, he follows her to her car. He says he was there at the concert as well. Feeling a little more magnanimous now that they have something in common, he asks what she wanted with him, and she explains she's looking for a guide. They sit down on his porch, and she explains what she's doing there, how this is her new project and she wants to go off-map and find never-before-seen images of Yosemite. He's skeptical, because a million photographers have done exactly the same thing, which is why she stresses the importance of his input. 
She doesn't know the park and it'd be dangerous for her to go off-road, but with him, she's got more chances of finding some elements of natural beauty in undiscovered places. He is still very much unconvinced, but agrees to help regardless, because if he doesn't, he's worried her naivete will get her into trouble. However, he can't start for another week as he has some things he's got to do. Zoe is frustrated, because she can't wait that long, but he refuses to budge, and so she decides it's not worth her time, and stomps off, saying she'll do it on her own. The next day, she heads back to the ranger's lodge and finds Sage. She asks her if she managed to find Jack, and Zoe says that she did, but he was insufferable, and Sage laughs and agrees he can be difficult to deal with but he's definitely the best. Zoe shrugs, unconcerned, and says she's going to head up to Cascade Falls on her own and start taking some pictures from there. Sage warns her to be careful, because the rocks can get slippery, and hands her a map. Zoe successfully hikes up to the falls and takes some great shots of the mountains. However, she gets her foot stuck in a gap between two boulders and can't move. She calls out for help, but there's nobody around. Just as she's resigned to waiting for someone to come along, a bear climbs up over the ridge, and Zoe screams for help, sure she's going to die. At that moment, Jack happens to be walking along the ridge, and sees the bear, shooing it away without any fear. He peers down to see Zoe caught in between the rocks and sighs. She's very grateful to see him and explains shamefully that she got stuck. Exasperated, he sets up some climbing gear and abseils smoothly down the cliff to reach her position. He takes some chalk out of his backpack, applying it to her shoe to loosen it, and helps her yank her leg out of the rocks. She's extremely grateful for his help, and he sternly tells her that she was lucky this time, but it's clear he thinks she's been reckless. He sets her up with a rope and gives her his helmet, helping her to climb back up the rocks to the top. She ascends the cliff successfully, with Jack encouraging her from below and spotting for her to make sure she doesn't fall. She's extremely proud of herself when she reaches the top, cheering and celebrating, and he grins despite himself, pleased by her obvious joy. On the way back down to the lodge, Zoe admits that it was foolish of her to go off alone, and Jack admonishes her for her stupidity, saying she might have passed away. She's petulant, saying he should have gone with her, and he tells her not to mess around. Sage told him where Zoe was headed and that's the only reason she's still alive. Zoe protests that she didn't think she'd see a bear, but Jack shakes his head, amazed at how naive she is. Endlessly optimistic, Zoe trots along beside Jack and talks about how they're bonding, now that he saved her life. He snorts and goes to get in his car, but she stops him, realizing that it's serious, and apologizes properly. She expresses her gratitude, and finally swayed. Jack agrees to help her in the following five days, but says that's all she's getting, and then she has to leave and never bother him again. Zoe agrees. Jack takes her to Casa's shop and sets her up with a full collection of hiking gear, shoes, a coat, a hat, thermals, a water bottle and various other accessories. She has fun in the store trying on everything, and Jack indulges her. The next morning, she heads to Sage's office all kitted out, and Sage is waiting there with Koss. Zoe thanks her for sending Jack to find her the previous day, and they get to talking about Koss, who tells her that he was born in the park, and their family line goes back 4,000 years in Yosemite. Jack arrives not long after and Zoe shows him a list of everywhere she wants to go in the five days he's promised her. Jack and Koss take a look at the list and say they'll be able to get some of them done very easily, but there are some difficult places that can be unpredictable and they might not be able to access, like Tenia Creek. Koss advises her they'll have to wait until the weather is right, because otherwise it'll be too dangerous. Zoe proclaims that she wants to get a unique photo of Half Dome, and Koss suggests going there at dawn, trying to get an angle from Mirror Lake, which is treacherous but possible. Jack and Zoe head out to Yosemite Falls first, and he shows her a great viewpoint from the forest. She sets up her camera and takes a fabulous shot, but it's very similar to a lot of other photos that have been taken. Jack leads her closer to the falls and tells her that there are actually three waterfalls there, that not many people know it's terraced. Zoe snaps a few more, and insists on getting some of Jack as well. He's reluctant, but she insists it's not just about nature shots, she wants to have some of the people living and working in the park to preserve it. He finally agrees, looking awkward and trying not to pose while she takes some shots of him. On the way back, they chat a little. Jack admits he looked her up online, and Zoe tells him her first love was fine art, but she got into photography at art school and found out she had an eye for it. She was a journalist before she went to art school, so her profession just kind of landed in her lap. Jack tells her he's a scientist and she teases him, saying she thought he was a musician based on the conducting display. He laughs, admitting music is his passion, particularly classics, but he's serious about conservation and data analysis. Photographs are beautiful but they don't tell the whole story of what's happening underneath, of the changing ecology and difficulties that the environment is facing. Zoe brings up a book he wrote about it, admitting that she googled him as well, and he seems reticent to discuss it, but she's keen to try and collaborate with him to highlight the conservation efforts that are ongoing at the park. He is tight-lipped and says he'll take her to the locations but he's not interested in a collaborative project. Amused, Zoe follows him as he walks off. They move about the park, taking photos of various landmarks and learning more about each other in the process. They are beginning to connect over the beauty of Yosemite. 
and their shared love of literature and history. Jack takes her to El Capitan, and explains in a voice full of wonder that he sees new things every single day. The weather patterns, the shifting scenery, the time of year, although some things are immovable, the park itself is constantly changing. Zoe is awed by his perspective. She takes a shot of El Capitan, and Jack tells her that he's climbed its face a few times. She's amazed that anyone can summit such a sheer cliff, and asks him if he'll take her to base camp so she can capture some of the climbers. He agrees, saying it'll be a good experience for her to learn about the history of the mountain. They encounter two climbers at the base of the cliff. One of them is from Chicago and knows of Zoe, and has her latest book. They agree to be included in her new collection, and Zoe takes several pictures of them ascending the mountain. Zoe asks Jack later on about why climbers do what they do. She can't get into the mindset of why people put themselves through it. He says that it's all about the challenge, it's what draws people, the idea of pushing themselves to the limit. He used to do free climbing without any ropes or harnesses, believing the danger added to the challenge, but he'd never do it again. They walk until they see Half Dome in the distance, but it's not the shot Zoe needs. However, Jack notices a couple embracing and looking out over the clifftop, and points them out. Zoe excitedly takes a picture of them. Jack grins, sitting down beside her. Zoe says she'd love to have some photos telling the story of the sustainability of the park, that the landscapes are for observation and conservation, not just beauty. Jack is impressed by her insight, seeing that she's starting to understand the park, and beginning to like her despite himself. He mentions that Sage and Koss have invited them over for dinner. At Sage's house, Koss greets them warmly, and Zoe says she's beginning to understand how Alice felt when she arrived in Wonderland. She sees an Ansel Adams shot on the wall and appreciates how he captured the beauty of Half Dome. There's a photo of Teddy Roosevelt on the wall, when the park was first designated a National Protected Reserve, and Zoe raises a toast, but also remembers to mention Koss's ancestors, who were there long beforehand. Sage questions Zoe's photography, saying that based on her other collections she likes to take photos of people rather than landscapes. Zoe agrees, she loves to tell stories. Jack nods and adds that he had to tear her away from the climbers earlier on. Sage suggests that maybe she could tell some of the stories of Yosemite from a Native American perspective in her new book. White people tend to think they discovered the park, but their tribe were in Yosemite Valley for centuries before that. When the miners came during the gold rush, there was a brutal relocation which forced all the indigenous people out of their homes and onto reservations. The last of the local tribe died out or moved away in the 1900s. Koss looks sad as he tells the tale, but says that even though they're gone, their spirits will always inhabit the valley. Zoe is moved, and turns to Jack, saying she wants to take photos of the historical places where people recited. Sage says that the past is complicated, but it's a part of the history of their home. Zoe has a call with Harris later on, explaining that she's planning on telling the Native American history as well as the traditional story, and he loves the idea. She tells him a little about Jack, and he's pleased she's found a good guide. The following day Jack takes Zoe down to the creek. He says he agrees with Sage, that although looking at the past can be painful, it's only through understanding history that we can build a stronger future. He sits down and hands Zoe a copy of his book, Conserving the West, which he bought for her from the local gallery. She's impressed with his depth of understanding, and realizes that if her book is going to be different, she needs his insight. She asks him again if he'll collaborate with her, and he's still unsure, but this time she pushes, saying he can write sections in his own name and help her find the pictures to highlight the points. She wants to make sure that it's not all just about art, that there is a reason behind every shot. Finally, swayed by her reasoning and wanting to spread the word about the conservation efforts, Jack agrees to co-author the book. They head back to Yosemite Falls and see there's a rainbow over the waterfall. Zoe is entranced and takes a beautiful photo, which she thinks is the best shot she's ever taken. Jack asks her if it'll be the cover image for the book. She looks up again, overwhelmed by the beauty of the natural world, and Jack comments that he's always wanted to know what's at the end of a rainbow. They decide to head down closer to the falls. They stop for a rest, and Zoe thanks Jack sincerely for his help, saying everyone should have a guide like him. He laughs off the comment, and admits that he doesn't like guiding but sometimes it works out okay. She teases him that he was grouchy at the beginning, and he says he was hoping that she would just turn around and head back to Chicago so he wouldn't have to deal with her. Tentatively, she asks what he thinks now, and he looks at her before admitting that he's starting to see the park through her eyes, and he loves how she sees it. Zoe questions him about his lifestyle, about whether it ever gets lonely, and he insists it doesn't. There's always a lot going on there even though he resides alone. She asks if he's ever been in love, and he complains about her nosiness, but answers that no, he hasn't. He turns the question back on her, and she starts talking about her old boyfriends, none of which she was ever really in love with. Jack explains that his view of love is more old school, that it's all about the little details. If he falls in love, it'll be because of the way she smiles, or her reaction to a sunrise, the things that bring her joy, what she sees that he doesn't see, the excitement at sharing a new day with her. 
It's an unspoken feeling that says the world is a better place because they are in it together. She's charmed by his words, beginning to cry at his pure and honest authenticity, and begins to see him in a whole new light as the sun sets over the mountains. He points it out to her, and she is spellbound by the glow, even as he watches her with a secret smile, thinking he may already be beginning to fall in love. He invites her for dinner at a local bar, on a whim, and she enthusiastically accepts. They have a dance floor, and there are dozens of patrons drinking, laughing and dancing to a live band. Over dinner, she tells him she's still missing that one shot that will tie the whole story together. Then she gets up to dance, and gestures for him to follow. He shakes his head, but gets up and dances with her. They banter during the dance, keeping it light, and he spins her around with a laugh. It's clear that the atmosphere between them has shifted to something romantic. Zoe catches up with Harris and tells him, too, that she's still missing the one shot that really soars, the thing that identifies her as an artist rather than just another photographer. He's surprised to hear that Jack will be co-writing the book, but doesn't object to it. Zoe and Jack head out again the next day, and Jack tells her how he got into climbing, going to Yosemite as a kid during summer. He fell into writing afterwards, when he became interested in conservation, and the proceeds from his book helped him achieve his dream of moving into the mountain cabin. Jack asks her about the last photo she's missing, and she insists she needs a photo of Half Dome, one that nobody's ever got before. They go to speak to Koss at the shop, and he tells them that there's a story in Native American culture that the mountain is a woman who quarreled with her husband, and ran off to the east, and her tears of guilt forever stained her face. From a certain angle, it's possible to see her tears. Zoe is ecstatic, this is the final picture she needs, the one which will tie the whole book together. However, the trail that leads to the base of Half Dome, which was created by Koss's grandfather, was closed because of an accident that happened there. There's no way for them to safely reach the western side of the mountain. Zoe is devastated that they won't be able to go. However, the next day, Koss is at Sage's office when they arrive, and says the look on her face hurt his heart, so he tells them the way his grandfather took him many years ago, marking it out on the map for them, up past Tenea Creek. That will take them close enough to see the face and her tears. Zoe is overjoyed and hugs him, thanking all three of them for their help. Jack gets a camping permit from Sage, and the pair set off, ready to get the final shot. They spend the day hiking up the creek and pitch their tents on a rocky ridge. They share a meal together, and Zoe tells Jack that she wants to tell his story in her book as well. There's a romance to who he is, the man who fell in love with Yosemite, and dedicated his life to preserving it. She says she's been thinking about him a lot. He's not keen on the idea, though, and deflects, offering her some dessert to distract her. Later, they're lying on their backs and Jack is pointing out constellations to her, when they see a shooting star. Zoe sighs and says that she loves this, and wishes she could preserve the moment forever. Jack asks her what's next for her, and she says it's back to Chicago. Both of them agree the week has gone by too fast. Jack sits up and looks her in the eyes, and tells her that when they were dancing, it was as if he could see her soul. He's never had that feeling before. Zoe smiles, saying that she feels the same, if they're together, the world is a better place, parroting his own words back at him. Then she leans in and kisses him, putting a hand on his cheek, and softly, he kisses her back. They retire to their separate tents, but there are coyotes howling, and Zoe's afraid. Jack gets out of his tent to shoo them away like he did with the bear. She follows him out and asks him if they're dangerous, but he says they won't hurt them. Zoe rushes forward and hugs him for comfort, still afraid. They break apart, and then, desperate to keep him outside, she asks if he's going to be okay as well, and he smiles and holds her tighter, wishing her goodnight. In the morning, Zoe awakens to Jack having made bacon and eggs for them. He's also brewed some coffee in a thermos. She marvels that he's not married, and he laughs. They leave their tent set up, and Jack says they'll grab their things on the way back down. Then they hike through the canyon together. Finally, they come to the other side of Half Dome, and are amazed to see the face and the tears that Koss spoke about. Zoe lines up her camera and takes the perfect shot, and Jack grins, excited that she's finally achieved her goal. She lays her head on his shoulder as they admire the beauty of the mountain. They drive back, and Zoe agrees to meet him on the patio at 7 p.m. to celebrate the end of their week. She shows up in a long summer dress, and Jack is entranced at the sight of her. They discuss the deadline for her book, and she says she'll send him the photos that night, and he can get started ASAP on his segments. He admits that he wishes she wasn't leaving, and she agrees with him, both lamenting the fact that they'll be alone again after knowing the magic of how it feels being together. Zoe calls him from Chicago, and she says that she loves his introduction and some of the pieces he's written for the book. However, when he excitedly asks about his essays, she says she can't use them because they're too long and data-driven. He's confused and upset, claiming he's a scientist and she knew that going in, but she's apologetic and says it doesn't fit. 
Disappointed, he hangs up, even as she protests. Jack ignores her calls for a while, deciding that he's going to try and change his essays to fit the book, but feeling frustrated that he can't write the way she needs him to. Finally, he calls her, and she rushes to answer, saying how happy she is to hear his voice. However, he's calling to tell her that he can't do it, he doesn't fit in her world. She's heartbroken and says that she's been thinking of ways to include it, because he's all over this book, on every page and in every photo. But he's resolute and says it's time they cut contact and move on, and wishes her all the best finishing it alone. She sobs uncontrollably as he hangs up. He stares down at his desk, deep in melancholy. Zoe asks her boss for more time, because she's struggling to finish the narrative, but Harris says he can't help her. She's panicking about how to finish when her doorbell rings, and she's shocked to see Jack there with a bouquet. He's decided to come and help her finish the book like he promised. She says there were sections of the essay she loved, and she wants to incorporate them. They work together for the full two days until the deadline, and manage to get everything done between them. Jack says he'll have to go to the airport to catch a flight back, but pauses as he's about to grab his bag, and turns around, telling Zoe he came back here because he's in love with her, and he wants to stay wherever she is. Tearfully, she tells him she loves him too, and she wants to be with him forever. They kiss to seal the promise. One year later, they're wandering hand in hand in Yosemite, and discussing the new project they'll be working on together, in the Grand Canyon. Zoe puts her arms around his neck and leans in, saying she has a question for him, then asks him if he'll marry her. He laughs, asking if she's always so forward, but says that he will. They get married in a private ceremony underneath Yosemite Falls, where they first fell in love, and share a kiss in the shadow of Half Dome, looking out at the breathtaking view of the park. 